part of the Boca Physics series on electromagnetism. Today's lecture, I'm going to calculate the magnetic field due to three different configurations. These problems, in my humble opinion, are more like graduate level electromagnetism problems. And if I stray outside the confines of undergraduate EM, I should have a good reason for doing so, and I do. The first problem we're going to look at is the magnetic field due to a solenoid. Now, we've already tackled this problem two other ways. We've, first of all, calculated the magnetic field due to a ring current, and that was the magnetic field along the axis of the ring, and basically we treated the solenoid as a stack of rings and just integrated over them. And what we found is that the magnetic field along the axis was just equal to mu naught in times i, where it is the number of turns per unit length, and in the c direction. Now, we also looked at this problem using an Peer's law. In that case, that enabled us to figure out that the magnetic field was uniform inside the solenoid, having that same value everywhere, and vanished outside. Now, so let me set up the BF sub R version. In this case, I'm going to make the same uh, assumption as I did before when we were using Ampere's law, that is to say that I can treat this current as a surface current density. So in other words, this can be written as Ni times phi direction, and recall that this is equal to minus C phi, phi prime x direction plus cosine phi prime y direction. Vio sub r law is equal to u naught over 4 pi surface integral of the cross product of the surface current density and the separation vector all over the magnitude of the separation vector cubed. You need to figure out what each of these terms is. We already know what the surface current density is. Now let's consider the surface element. We're integrating over the surface of the cylinder, so that is R d phi prime dz prime. Field vector, or observation vector. Just write, um, this is S cosine phi x direction plus S sine phi y direction plus z, z direction. Now, what you want to notice here is that this system is symmetric about the axis. So in other words, I would expect the magnetic field to behave the same way, each point is uh, equidistant from it, and either, well, we've already determined it's going to be pointing in the z direction, but uh, the point of it is that, um, even assuming we didn't know that in advance, just by symmetry, there can be no dependence on phi, so why not set phi equal to some arbitrary value? So in other words, let's set phi equal to zero degrees. So this is S x direction plus z, z direction. R prime, that's just radius of solenoid. times cosine phi prime x direction plus radius of solenoid sine phi prime y direction plus z prime z direction. Separation vector then is S minus r cosine phi prime x direction minus r sine phi prime y direction plus z minus z prime z direction. The magnitude is square root of the sum of the squares and without writing out the intermediate steps, but being aware that I'm making use of the fact that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1, I wind up with s squared minus 2sr cosine phi prime plus r squared Oops, just R squared. Plus Z minus Z prime squared. Here's one last 
part of the end rate I need to figure out, and that's a cross product of the surface current density and the separation vector. Um, figuring out the x term first. That's equal to r. Rather cosine phi prime times z minus c prime. going to be have a sine squared, r sine squared, and this term is going to be an r cosine squared, so it'll be r minus s cosine phi prime. out of the integral. And also pull the r out as well. So this is d phi prime 0 to 2 pi. So the r comes from this da prime is equal to r d phi prime dz prime. And I'll handle the z integral first because it's easier that way. Okay, before I write everything out, um, notice that I'm going to have this cubed in the denominator. Or I should say before I write any of these terms in the numerator out, we'll have this in the denominator. z prime over all this stuff here, plus basically z minus z prime squared, all to the 3 halves power. When we integrate it, I'll wind up with um, something of the form of 1 over all this stuff, plus z minus z prime squared, all, um, all square root. When I evaluate those, um, that integral at the limits, minus L over 2 and L over 2, those are going to drop out. So I'm not even going to bother writing it down here. Those are going to integrate to 0. So I just have this one term. This is r minus s cosine phi prime in the numerator. And I will pull the z carry out front as well. Okay, I'm going to make a change of variables. Instead of writing all this, I'm just going to introduce d squared, that's equal to s squared, minus 2sr, cosine phi prime, plus r squared.
Okay, so I'm going to do this integral, and we've handled um, or encountered this integral quite frequently during the semester. Um, there are two things I can do right now, because I'm basically going to take the limit of L over 2 goes to infinity. So I can be very careful, and uh, when I make a change of variables, convert this over to say u, u is equal to z minus z prime, and then, you know, have a minus sign here and then adjust the limits accordingly. Or I could, at this stage, say, well, I know that I'm not going to be anywhere near the endpoints. So therefore, I might as well just say, well, let's just evaluate this integral. Just at the midplane, okay? Because if I'm far enough away from the endpoints, that's not going to um, that's not going to affect my integral at all. So with that in mind, this winds up going as. z prime over d squared over um, d squared plus z prime squared to the one half power evaluated at minus l over 2 to l over 2. And if I basically take the limit as l over 2 goes to infinity, this z prime is going to cancel out with that one, or that, or I should say that l over 2 is going to cancel with this one, so basically you're going to have um, from this 1 minus minus 1. So ultimately you wind up with 2 over d squared. Okay? So if you're mind if I go a little bit more uh, cautious here and left, or not cautious, uh, um, a little bit more ticky or picky, shall we say, and left the z minus z prime, it would have wound up being the same thing. The point is, just as long as you're not anywhere near the endpoints and you assume that the solenoid would be infinitely long, this is the result of the integral. Okay, so now, let's see, don't have too much room there. I'm going to erase this uh, left hand side. is basically 2 over d squared. I'm going to go ahead and take care of that 2 right now. Okay. I need to rewrite this numerator, r minus s cosine phi prime, such as I can um, reorganize this integral and make the integration a little bit easier to handle. So this is take r squared plus s squared minus 2sr cosine phi prime minus s squared.
So <clears throat> in the numerator, this in fact will go to r minus s cosine phi prime, just written r squared um, as basically r squared plus r squared and then dividing by two and r to take care of that. s squared minus s squared, I'm just adding zero to that. And then this two sr cosine phi prime term dividing by two r, so that leaves this here, okay? Therefore, substituting this up into here, this 2r uh, will give 4 pi, we'll have 2 pi times 2, so it's just 4 pi. This r cancels with this one, right away from 0 to 2 pi. We have one basically, and then we have plus r squared minus s squared all over s squared minus two s r cosine v prime plus r squared. handle this integral. If you've taken math physics before, you might recognize this integral. When you were doing the, using the techniques of complex analysis, in particular calculus of residues, because this integral using the calculus of residues. But anyway, this is the upshot of it. This integral is just equal to 2 pi over square root of a squared minus b squared. Now, comparing this with this, a is equal to s squared plus r squared, and b is equal to minus 2sr. So therefore, this integral becomes square root of s squared plus r squared squared minus minus 2sr squared. value of s squared minus r squared. Okay, so first term disintegrates sum to 2 pi. Second term to r squared minus s squared times 2 pi over the absolute value of s squared minus r squared. Inside the solenoid, r is greater than s. So basically, you'll have r squared minus s squared over r squared minus s squared, which is just 1. We'll have 2 pi plus 2 pi, 4 pi, so that 4 pi will cancel with this one. You'll be left with mu naught and i in z direction. Now what about outside? Side, this will be 
be r squared minus s squared. When um, s is greater than r, this just becomes s squared minus r squared, which is negative 1. So we have 2 pi minus 2 pi, which is 0. And that is exactly the same result as I got before using Ampere's law. Only this time, uh, I took a great deal more effort to arrive at an answer. The next example I'm going to work out is that of the magnetic field along the z-axis due to a uniformly charged sphere that rotates with speed omega. Okay, so first inclination might be, well, let's just dive right in there. Um, come up with an expression for the volume current density and then grind through the Bios of R law. But the thing that is, um, we're only asking for it along the z-axis and it would be good if we could actually break this down into simpler parts and use a result that we already have obtained using the Bios of R law. So if I can start with the current carrying ring and extend that result to a disk, a uniformly charged disk, and then in turn extend that result to a uni uh, uniformly charged sphere, well, I'm in business. So let's start, let's do it this way. Let's recall that the magnetic field due to a current carrying ring along the z-axis mu dot i r squared, where r is the radius of the current carrying ring, all over 2 r squared plus z squared at 3 halves power, directed in the z direction. Let's consider a disk. And the z axis will assume is directed out of the board. The first thing you need to do is to figure out an expression for the current. Current's going to vary depending on where you are. Because after all, at different points of the disk are moving at different speeds. You can get the current by recognizing that it's defined as the amount of charge transported per unit time. I'm going to figure out the amount of charge located in this thin ring here. uniformly charged, and that means it bears surface charge density sigma. The area of this ring is 2 pi r, the circumference of the ring, times dr, which is the thickness. Now the time to make a single revolution is just 2 pi over omega. I is equal to sigma omega r dr. Now, another uh, modification you need to make of this is that this expression holds for a ring of radius capital R, right? But we're basically assuming that this whole disk is made up of a bunch of rings, infinitesimally side rings, and we're going to integrate. So I'm going to replace this r, capital R, by little r.
all the constants out front. calculation yourself. Now from my integral table I see that this gives me Well, the 4z squared drops out of every term. Okay, so we're partway there. Fortunately, I can't say that we're even halfway there. Maybe a fourth of the way. Okay, so I'm going to hold this result over. I'm actually going to write it over here. a little bit more room. So I'll just leave it up here for another minute or a few seconds rather and I will erase. field due to a uniformly charged disk. Okay, so let's consider another ring. Therefore, this distance is R cosine theta, and this distance is R sine theta. We need to go from the surface charge density over to a volume charge density. my surface charge density by a volume charge density of a certain thickness d. And that thickness is going to be r sine theta d theta. changes as well. That's going to go over to our sine theta. And z is going to go over to z minus r cosine theta. So 
R sine theta is going that way. Uh, Z minus R cosine theta is going that way. It's useful to rewrite this um, quantity in bra brackets here. So I'll do that first. this r squared by 2. We factored out 2 and I got 2 times r squared plus z squared over square root of r squared plus z squared. But then I subtracted off minus r squared. So basically I'm adding um, r squared to this and subtracting off minus uh, r squared. So adding 0. We've got minus r squared over square root of r squared plus z squared minus 2z. Writing this again, this will give me 2 times r squared plus c squared minus r squared over square root of r squared plus c squared minus 2z. substitute in so I can convert um, my disk to basically we're going to write it out so we can integrate all over a bunch of stack of disks uh, to find out what the contribution is from all those to arrive at a solution for the magnetic field due to a sphere. there for a minute so you can take it in. We have mu naught omega over 2 in z direction. Integral from 0 to pi. So we're going to basically sum up uh, the contributions from all these disks of infinitesimal thickness. Rho r sine theta d theta bracket 2 times square root of r squared sine squared theta plus z minus r cosine theta quantity squared minus r squared sine squared theta all over square root of r squared sine squared theta plus z minus r cosine theta squared minus 2 minus um, z minus r cosine theta. Okay, so getting a picture already that this is a messy problem, you are right. Okay. 
Okay, so let's make a substitution here. Let's say we write u is equal to cosine theta, du is equal to minus sine theta, d theta. That'll have the effect of changing the limits of integration from 0 to pi to 1 to minus pi. But we've got this minus sine, so I can flip that back around. And this is equal to mu naught omega over 2 z direction actually you think about write it over here instead And again, we'll make use of the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. So that'll result in an r squared minus 2zr cosine theta plus z squared minus. And since I'm making a substitution that u is equal to cosine theta, I'm going to replace this sine squared theta by 1 minus cosine squared theta. Factor out of two from everyone, that leaves us with an, a half here. There's your interval that has to be calculated. And we'll erase this part. And because these intervals are messy to handle, I'm just going to write the final result for each of these. <clears throat> rather than uh, doing the algebra and you need to have these all at issue. Okay, so we'll call the first interval B1.
Okay, so <clears throat> when he takes up enough room on the board as it is, this algebra to get this answer is really ugly, so um, I'm just going to quote you the final result there. These, um, or I'll read it off, 2 thirds over z, 3z squared plus r squared. This is 2 over z, r squared over 2. This is r over 15 z cubed, r squared plus 5 half z squared, r squared over 2. These are the only easy ones to handle. This is 2z, and that is 0. So we need to plug all of this into here. First, I call this one B3 and that B2. Let me read this off. It's mu naught omega rho r z direction bracket 2z plus 2r squared over 3z plus 2r to the fourth over 15z cubed plus r squared over 3z minus r squared over z minus 2z. This, this cancels with this, this, and this cancel this, and we'll just be left with mu naught omega rho r to the fifth over 15 z cubed in the z direction. And a factor of two left over. I'm going to go a step further and stick in um, this in terms of q rather than the, the volume charge density. Final result is mu naught, the permeability, times the angular speed, times the charge, total charge, times the radius of the sphere squared, all over 10 pi z cubed in the z direction. 
this was a very, very messy problem to handle. It's a um, difficult one, in my opinion. And it is graduate level. Um, basically, just by building this problem up from an, a result that we obtained pretty readily using the BS of our law, in other words, the magnetic field due to a current carrying ring along the axis of the ring, we extended that result by integration to figure out what the magnetic field was due to a uniformly charged disk. We extended that result one step further to um, handle a sphere of uniform charge density. And after much work, and believe me, uh, see this, one of these integrals is really ugly, or the algebra gets really ugly to handle. So that's why I just quoted you the final result, and uh, that concludes this example. Well, we've arrived at the third and final example that I'll be working through today, and that is the magnetic field due to a current carrying ring. And in this case, we are going to determine the magnetic field due to this ring at arbitrary points in space, not just along the z-axis. Now, following a little bit different procedure from before, as you see, I've already written uh, part of the solution on the board, and um, basically I'll walk through it, I'll give you a few minutes to take it in, and then we'll move on to the, the next part of the solution. The reason why I'm covering this problem, even though you don't do it in undergraduate electromagnetics, and, and I believe J.D. Jackson does not have this problem either, uh, basically is because I want you to be more familiar with the elliptic integrals, um, first and second complete elliptic integrals. If you want to find out more information about these uh, quantities, consult either the textbooks by Boas or by Arfkin. They've got some good examples in there, and I encourage you to go through them where a lot of times students in math physics don't actually get to elliptic integrals, spend a lot of time on the genre polynomials, Bessel functions, all that kind of stuff, which is a good thing, but um, you know, you should also not miss out on elliptic integrals as well. I just think people should know about that. Number two, uh, basically during the course of a discussion of magnetostatics, everything's kind of boiled down to two basic geometries, either straight wires or current carrying rings or some combination thereof. We, went, we talked about current sheets as well, okay? But everything boils down to those geometries, and I want to show you what the magnetic field looks like, or what form it has, I should say, for a current carrying ring. Uh, basically, this is a big math problem, and I just want you to see where that equation comes from. Now, that's also another reason why I'm not going to uh, spend so much time talking as I'm writing, okay? So, anyway, with that being said, we'll start with the magnetic vector potential. And that's equal to mu dot i over pi k, square root of radius of the ring over s, times brackets, 1 minus k squared over 2, elliptic integral of the first kind minus elliptic integral of the second kind, and this is in a circumferential direction. So in this case, the magnetic vector potential is in the same direction as the current. Just as a reminder, this is the first elliptic integral, k, 0 to pi over 2, integral um, of 1 over 1 minus k squared sine squared phi. Second elliptic integral e 0 to pi over 2 of square root of 1 minus k squared sine squared phi. And k squared, little k squared, is 4rs over s plus r squared plus z squared. Okay, so to get to the curl or the magnetic field, you have to calculate the curl of the magnetic vector potential. And when you do that, these are the only two surviving terms. What I've done so far is to calculate partial derivatives that I'm going to use to um, arrive at a solution. So in the first case, we're calculating the partial derivative of k, little k, with respect to z. I'll just read off the final result. That's minus zk cubed over 4rs. And then the partial derivative of k with respect to s. And that boils down to, after you do all the math, little k over 2s minus little k cubed over 4r minus little k cubed over 4s. Now I need to figure out what the partial derivative of a is with respect to little k. And I'll read this off. It's mu naught at i over pi, square root of r over s, brackets, minus 1 over little k squared times bracket, um, 1 minus k squared over 2, um, Elliptic integral 1 minus elliptic integral 2, bracket minus k over k, little k over little k. Those cancel out, and we have uh, first elliptic integral plus 1 over little k, 
1 minus k squared over 2, derivative of the elliptic integral with respect to little k, minus 1 over k elliptic integral, derivative of, of elliptic integral with respect to little k. And down here, I've worked out what those derivatives are, mostly. Okay, in the first case, if you look at the derivative of e with respect to little k, you're just going to wind up with e over little k minus k, big um, first elliptic integral over little k. In the, uh, this case, we have minus big k over little k, uh, complete, complete in a, elliptic integral, the first kind over little k. Over here, you notice I've just uh, said, asserted that this integral is equal to e over 1 minus k squared. The reason why I've done that is because in order to demonstrate that this is equal to this, you have to do an expansion of the elliptic integrals. And uh, I don't want to digress too far out of, um, out of this, the scope of the problem. So Arfkin actually does give that homework problem in his book. So uh, if you, you're interested, go ahead and work through it. So for now, I'm going to leave this up here for a few minutes so you can uh, take everything in. After making those substitutions for the derivatives, you will wind up with this expression. I'll just read it out. u naught i over pi, square root of r over s, bracket, minus big K over little k squared, plus e over little k squared, times 1 minus k squared over 2, over 1 minus k squared. So I'm plugging um, this into here. So this is a partial derivative of the vector potential with respect to z. Got, um, Again, the same coefficient out front, and then I've added minus the z k cubed over 4 rs. That's partial derivative k with respect to z, and then we just bring this bracket down here. I've worked out what minus 1 minus k squared over 2 over 1 minus k squared is equal to, and uh, basically plugging everything in and getting rid of the little k's and writing everything in terms of r, s, and z. So, I'll read off the solution. This is the s component of the magnetic field. It's mu naught i over 2 pi s, z over square root of s plus r squared plus z squared, bracket, minus k, first elliptic integral of the first kind plus elliptic integral of the second kind, 
r squared plus s squared plus z squared all over r minus s squared plus z squared. And once again, I'll leave this up on the board for about a minute or so. BZ, the Z component of the magnetic field, has a form of 1 over S, partial derivative with respect to S of S times A phi. So I have calculated that. This first term corresponds to A phi over S. Second term corresponds to taking the derivative of A phi, partial derivative of A phi with respect to S. And then this last term, of course, because K also depends on S, we have um, partial derivative of A phi with respect to K and partial derivative of k with respect to s. Now, sticking everything together and collecting terms corresponding to elliptic interval k and terms corresponding to elliptical interval e. So quite a lot of work. Um, not so much here in this bracket, but if you do the math, you'll see that this is equal to, this term is equal to k times little k squared over 4r. This takes somewhat more effort to get it into the right form. Uh, ultimately, this is equal to ES R squared minus S squared minus Z squared all over R plus S squared plus Z squared and then what times 1 over R minus S squared plus Z squared. So I'm going to plug those, um, put everything together, and this is written part way with both K and E terms. And then I will just read out the solution mu dot i over 2 pi, 1 over square root of s plus r squared plus c squared bracket um, interval, elliptic interval k plus elliptic interval e, r squared minus s, minus s squared minus z squared over r minus s squared plus z squared. So there's a lot of work into arriving at a solution which is, um, and perhaps not all that illuminating to go through these steps. Um, it's really just a math problem. However, as I said, I'm loath to, uh, to show you a solution without showing you where it came from. So I will just leave it up here on the board for a few minutes or a minute or so. So again, you can take everything in and that, that will be the end of today's lecture.